Okay, so uh, just very quick for the camera here, please state your name and age. Oh, Alan <laughs> Hunter is my name. I'm 79. And just over here, your name and age, please. Simon Gramlich. I don't know my age. Yes. <laughs> get, 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 get 92, sir. Eh? 92. 92. 92 years old. And last but not least, Don Hunt. And I'm 83. A young fellow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, where were you born? <clears throat> well, I was born in Calgary. We lived in, <clears throat> in a place called Poverty Flats in Turner Valley. Poverty Flats. The bottom drawer of, my, of the dresser was my crib. <laughs> that was pretty handy because when I stopped yeah. too much, I just shut the drawer. And uh, at that time, what did your parents do? Well, my father was a roughneck on a drug at the time. So I started out in the Yeah, yeah, so we'll, we'll get to that, but absolutely. Did he, uh, at that time, did he already work for Imperial Oil? Or? Yes, he okay. he worked for Imperial Oil for he, how old? He started in 1923, so I was born in 1935, so uh, he'd worked for them. 12 years, except he was laid off during the Depression for two. So he, I think he had eight years. Thank you. And where were you born? Where was the provost, I think? Told me with first baby born, first baby boy born, and the provost foster. Yeah, oh, but that's right. But uh, like uh, those those uh, they they met with met boys, you know. But uh, in provost there, yeah. And uh, I was the first baby born in provost hospital. It's quite an honor. Well, I, I didn't know it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But yeah, you know, that's the way it went. And, and growing up as a child, what did your parents do? Uh, what did my parents do? Oh, well, it's either. Why, well, yeah. When I go back. He started out on the farm. Yeah, but uh, we went out. Well, what the heck Oh, uh, there was a there was a <coughs> spouse. He had uh, met uh, met with the and he the and the, the they were it was paid, eh? And the inspector came out, and he had used some of their money, and it was cut off right now. So they and and Olin Staus, he had no money, you know. So they they rented about three boys, and so he had nothing, you know. It was pretty bad, but uh, that's the way it went. He had the post office. Who are you talking about? Is that your dad? No. No, no, no. No. But this Mr. Stouse, when, when they found that he had used some of the money, he had planned on putting it back. But the inspector came out well, unexpectedly. And of course, the money wasn't there. So yeah. they fired him. So he was the one that told Sai's dad, you should try for that job because you were in the armed forces yeah. so you know you could work for the post office so uh, your father got that job and he had a, a little store in the same building as the post office yeah and then he sold gas like was that in Bodo yeah yeah at Bodo. 
I remember that. Thanks. Were I remember that. Big well, I went to Provost. Yeah, we went to Provost. Oh, yeah. I think. I'm sure I did. Thank you. That's uh, Ryan Hill. Thank you. That's a I I said one time. Well, oh, well, this is another story. Uh, we were when I when I said. Uh, oh, we were in Hawaii. We were in Hawaii. And uh, what happened? Two other women, and he had asked the bus driver, <clears throat> the tour bus driver, where would be the nicest place to go for dinner that night. And he said, oh, the Cocoa Falls. But he said, you'll never get in. They have, you have to wait for two weeks. And I'll make an appointment and you wait for two weeks. So we stopped at the Cocoa Falls and we were just in our shorts. and. I think he did have a shirt on. <laughs> he goes in there and he said, I'd, I'd like a table for four for tonight for, for the dinner on the show. And she said, oh, sir, uh, you know, if, you're, if you'll be here two weeks from now, I can help you. He said, no. He said, I won't be here. But he said, I'm a pretty important person. <laughs> and I got through. So he said, you better write my name down. So she wrote his name down. And we went back to our motel, a hotel, whatever it was. And we told these two uh, strange women, they had gotten a car and they were elderly, like we are today. <clears throat> and so aside, said, I feel sorry for those two women. He said, I, I want to see if they want to amalgamate with us. So he went up and asked them, and they said, we would love it. We can't really take in the scenery because she's driving and I'm looking at the map for her. And she said, we just love that. And so we had a wonderful time with them. We got a bigger car. So we told them, you know, to be ready at six o'clock and we, see if we could get into the Coco Palms for supper. So we get in there and of course we're all dressed by that time. And uh, so I said, uh, Simon Gramlick and friends. And she looks and she said, oh yes, your name is here. <laughs> <laughs> we got a ringside seat <laughs> right there, there where they were entertaining, you know, doing the hula dancing and all that stuff. With the two uh, older ladies. <laughs> I was a poet. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a good thing that he had said, you know, well, write down my name just in case, because I think it was a different girl when we came back later that night. Uh, so I thought the name, name was there. <laughs> she wrote it down. Oh, you can back a bit. You can look up by the guys to be sharp. <laughs> well, I think that's how you got me. <laughs> oh, oh you go. yes, dear. I it did. comes out. <laughs> so if we turn over here, Mr. Hunt, uh, where were you born? In Mooseman, Saskatchewan. And uh, and what did your parents do as a Well, my child? dad was a farmer, but then, of course, we dried out in the 30s. My mother was a telephone operator. So she took over the telephone office in a little town south of Regina, Radford, and we lived there for 10 years. But I really never knew my dad. He was away all the time. Finding work? Well, he, he uh, got work on a farm, and then, and then they, they, they moved his rigs in, into Saskatchewan. So he went to work on the drilling rigs for... Uh, was it Burns? Was it yeah. Tool Push? Burns was a tool push? Yeah, well, it was his first name. And uh, he worked on the rigs, in, well, through Saskatchewan, and through the the, uh, the 40s. And then in 46, Tommy Douglas came on the scene, and he was going to nationalize the oil industry in Saskatchewan. So they moved both the drilling rigs out of Saskatchewan to Provost. And, uh, 
that's when we moved her. My mother gave up the telephone office, and that's when we moved to Provost. And then from then on, it was Provost to do the so, so both Don's, your fathers were already involved in the, in the petroleum industry, but uh, Cy, how did you get into that business? If your father was mostly in, uh, for more for the post at least for for a while. I don't. Well, you you came out of the army. Yeah. And and were at home when the the drilling rig from Saskatchewan came into Provost. And I think that's when you joined Imperial War. Okay. My, my dad gave him a job uh, on the rig. Oh, mechanic, yeah. As, as a, a mechanic, mechanic, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I wanted to do, what were you in the Army? Were you a mechanic in the Army? In the Army? I was marching. <laughs> <laughs> no, you were a dispatcher in the Army. And you were on a motorcycle. Yeah, you were a dispatcher. Dispatch rider. Oh, yeah, no, no. Comes a little bit. I had a Harley for uh, uh, to, uh, to ride, ride and uh, now what the hell was it? And the, the British had that uh, uh, small one, but it was handier. Uh, uh, oh, uh, 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 mail, eh? And you take it with uh, at night, uh, like, and, and you move what, 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 when then you, the office, when you came out, you were blind. So we, what we had, we had the one eye uh, shut, and, uh, and then when we got out, out we had uh, the other eye out. Uh, so that's the way that went. Okay. And and when you came back, um, that's when you started working for Imperial Oil as a as a mechanic. And were you uh, were you on that uh, that journey with your father uh, with the uh, I guess the the dry holes first because he had uh, he had uh, they were about, Imperial Oil was about to give up with one hundred and thirty three dry holes. Yeah, they, uh, uh, well, Cy started in Provost. Okay. So, on, on the, at that time, uh, uh, we'd been all over Saskatchewan. My dad had drilled about 10 dry holes. Imperial Oil had five rigs of Wildcat. And, uh, so that's where the 133 came in. My dad never professed to drill all 133. <laughs> he drilled about 10 or 12 or something. And one was a provost, although it was a bit of a teaser. And then uh, when Cy moved on, then uh, uh, we signed on, we moved to the Duke and, and drilled the uh, Duke number one discovery. And that's uh, in, in 46. Well, we moved in 46 and, and drilled over Christmas. And, uh, yeah, I remember running a, or oh, what did you call it, Chuckies? Talks, talks, uh, thing that you do to get the elevation. Yeah. Cut cold. Oh, cold. Yeah. What is that? Oh, you drop it down the drill pipe, and uh, it's got a little dart in there, and it measures the angle of your bit. So oh. if you you take them every once in a while to make sure you're not going crooked. Because you only have certain limits you can drill in, and you drop them down, and then you fish it out and take a look, and oh, you're okay. Uh, and then we had to put up head to heads on, and uh, uh, they're there for, uh, uh, we want them, but then we could change, always uh, had control of it, you know. Uh, uh, Webstocks? Uh, Webstocks? I don't know what the hell, but uh, uh, you could uh, shut it, shut it off. Uh, a taco, a taco. No, that, that's uh, not to, to do. <laughs> like when we uh, drill sign test. 
对对对。好可爱。哎，你以为？喂。It ain't so important. It's important. Well, they did run some drill test, drill test tests, and then they had core. They were coring too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wireline coring. We uh, we always had control of it. You know, what's up to do it in with two red heads there. And oh, the low preventers. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It's a damn good thing we're not drilling now. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be in damn bad trouble. <laughs> well, no, then we'd get back into it. <laughs> no, what was and, uh, and And do you gentlemen remember um, when you guys finally struck oil? I led you number one, or oh yeah, Alex, because you were eleven. I was eleven. Uh, yeah, I remember. I remember my I, yeah, I remember my dad coming. Don and I used to. I used to drive out with Don and his dad in the truck, and and with and what was the dog name? Brownie. Brownie, yeah. It, the dog had to have the window seat. Yeah. <laughs> so were you out there that day that no, it came in? No, I. I no, my dad. I had no school. He came home. I he, went out there when they brought in the dude too, but that was morning for me. Yeah, that was a little later. I went out there a few days later. Yeah, but uh, it was during the week, so I just remember my dad got called out in the middle of the night. They had the, 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 the swabbing down, you know. so he had to go up there. Is he still, still alive? No. Thirty years ago. Oh. And and were you there the first day? You guys uh, struck oil for the Duke number one. Were you on shift? As, as a mechanic. Yeah. 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 How was uh, how was everyone's reaction to that? Well, I don't remember too much. Period. <laughs> Striking oil was kind of a novelty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, I, I don't know. It was. Uh, you kind of remember the parties, like that. Uh, <laughs> what's his name had a big party? The farmer. Oh, Turda. Uh, Turda? Was it Turda? Was it, was it Turda? Mike Turda. Mike Turda. Yeah. Mike Turda. Yeah. Didn't yeah. have a big party or something? I don't. I, I didn't know Si at that time. I'm just. I think. Of, I think he bought some whiskey for you guys. Yeah. I think Mike turned a bought some whiskey for you guys. Yeah, and uh, we had that uh, Bertha, the big truck. Oh, yeah, big truck. Yeah. yeah, and we went with it to get <laughs> whiskey, and the the hood uh, fell off. We turned it all, all over. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, at, th at that time, uh, you were, do you remember how old you were? You <laughs> must have been about 24 or 25. Okay, still still pretty young. Well, didn't you board at Turtles? Were, hey. were you one of the guys that boarded at Turtles? I don't no, think so. I think no. you boarded at Henderson to do no there's a couple of guys did. Mike, Charlie, yeah. <clears throat> I think you boarded with Henderson's, and then later, I think you boarded at the Duke's. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> the <pot> thick and <laughs> <laughs> We had a girlfriend, uh. Ruby the Duke. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now the memory can <laughs> say what? <laughs> <laughs> Ruby may do. And I think that was the first time that I met Don. We went to um, the Duke for the New Year's Eve dance. Yeah. And so I wanted me to meet your mom and dad. So we went over to your place. Your dad wasn't in, but your mom was there. And you and Sherry were playing ping pong. Oh, okay. I don't know. And uh, I thought they they were like 
two really nice boys. <laughs> where would where would we where would we be playing ping pong? On the table, on the dining room table. In our skid shack? No. No, I think no. you lived you, were, in, you lived in that big house then. Yeah. Oh with Clarence and Beatrice. Yeah, yeah, along the railroad track. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And uh, so then we went to the dance. No, we got off the train and his girlfriend and her girlfriend were at the train station. And when they saw me, they started singing, I want her, you can have her, she's too fat for me. <laughs> well, I wasn't fat. <laughs> it was bringing me into a hornet's nest. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. So, so anyway, his next stop from Leduc, the rig moved to Marathorpe. And that's where my hometown was. And he met me, so... So uh, he met you when he moved there, or was it already he had met you before? No, when he moved to Marathon, he met me, after Leduc. Okay. So, so on his long change, he would go back to Leduc to see Ruby, <laughs> his old girlfriend. Five <laughs> <Lots of> seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and then, he, then the rig had sat for six weeks at Marathor because um, the farmer wouldn't let, that was going to let you boys on the, the land in the Duke again, wouldn't let Imperial on there unless they brought back the same grilling rig. No. That was old Sander. Okay. Yeah, oh. it had to be an Imperial oil owned rig. Yeah, the yeah. old rig that brought in the Duke number one. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. She, she knows more than I do. <laughs> well, I can just remember more. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so they were sent back to the Duke. So then on his long change in the Duke, then he would come to Marathon to see me. So things changed. <laughs> <laughs> He's always busy. <laughs> so I think all of, the, all of the guys on the rig were kind of like that. Until they got married. Yeah, and that settled down. <laughs> and um, I didn't go wrong, though. No, you sure as heck didn't. Well, I guess not. I, I've lived longer than Ruby. She died many years ago. So. <laughs> <laughs> what they're saying is you made a hell of a good choice. Yeah, <laughs> they were pretty smart in those days. <laughs> now you have to work on that. It see. Yeah, I was 18, and he was 26. Oh, what was it? I was 18, you were 26. I don't tell him. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Isn't that what they call jailbait today? No, oh, no, 18 is okay. 18 is okay. 18 is legal. <laughs> 16, then maybe there's yeah. Yeah, but 18 is all good. Um, so do you... Uh, that's a question for everybody, really. Um, from Leduc number one on, how did that change, whether it was um, right after or years to come, how did that change um, the oil industry and, and the company, really? Well, uh, well, first of all, no, we didn't really believe it. <laughs> yeah. We thought maybe this is... A, had so many disappointments. Have a teaser. Yeah, that the, you just uh, until they they started moving in other drilling rigs. Imperial Oil had two of their own rigs, but they hired some more other rigs, and uh, and people started coming from all over. Uh, from, a lot from Turner Valley, the people we knew. <coughs> <that was the, coughs> excuse me. Uh, and then finally they built the town of Devon. That's kind of when it sunk in. It was a pretty big oil. Imperial oil, I know, it was a pretty big oil from the seismograph. But for us, it, it kind of took a, about a year or yeah. a little more to, to really sink in that this is really something. And, and then, of course, in 1948, they found red water. Uh, they found Golden Spike in 48. Yeah. They, they started to find. 
right around, the, around the, right the general area they found to find production. Some pre pretty big oil fields they found. I remember we had uh, that big Bertha truck. Eh? Or yeah, the, big Bertha. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And uh, we uh, used to just go over to the farm and get more liquor. <laughs> You get what side? More, more liquor. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. There's a there's a good question. Was there um, in your guys' line of work with uh, with all the guys there? Was that often uh, was uh, was drinking uh, a big social trend? Oh, a big part of it. Though. A big part of yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not on the job. No. Okay. But, uh, yeah, there was <laughs> there was Johnny Morrow was one. There was a few that had the odd drink. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. But, uh, my dad would never put up. That. And what was uh, the one uh, the, that there was uh, chasing, uh, or the woman, and, and, and he, she said, "Dad, that was that was with Bezer." Oh, Tony <laughs> Bezer. Yeah. He, he, he said, "Oh, but I like," and then he said, she, she said, and then. Oh, he go back. Oh, I like for you too. <laughs> what, was that his wife? No. Oh. <laughs> you talking about Johnny, huh? No. Yeah, yeah. He was a terrible. He yeah. did drink, drink on the job. Oh, he was <laughs> terrible. I worked for him. No, I did too. <laughs> so, I like working for him because I, because he drank a, a lot. A lot of the other guys did too. So they weren't coming to work. <laughs> And he'd always get to come get me because I told him I didn't think. Yeah, I did. Uh, but I was working lots of sixteens, and uh, I was I was pretty broke, so I wanted to work on it. And he'd always come and get me uh, to, to work at sixteen if somebody didn't show up. So I really liked working on that rig because I was making I was making as much money as he was. <laughs> so, so generally, rule of thumb was if you drink. You're not you're not working on the rig that day. And how were the how were the working conditions? All right, let's compare them. Actually, how were the working conditions back in the day to to today? The well, I lines. thought they were good. Yeah, yeah. I mean they're good as far as I was concerned. Well, on the Imperial Oil rigs, it was always good. They never, well, Johnny's Johnny Business rig was, but he had such experienced drillers that the rig ran better when he wasn't there. They were all pretty good. Too. Nobody came away drunk. And, uh, but it, some of the contract rigs, they had a bigger turnover. Uh, some of the working conditions were were not so good, and some of the equipment was not so good. Like what? What are examples? Uh, oh, just old equipment. Uh, drillers trying to make too much time. Leaving you out of nature calls. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, when I was going to high school, I started to work for General Petroleum, and I on a lease crew, building locations. I was going to high school then, and then and, and then I worked in there a little while, and then shorthanded on the rig. So I started working on the rig, and I had a hell of a deal when I was going to high school. I, I've worked weekends, holidays, for GP on the rigs, and I had a really good deal. And uh, so, so I have a problem. He's getting there. No, uh, no, I, uh, thinking back. Thinking back to the 40s uh, and working for GP and, and that, uh, I, I really, really was doing good at going to high school. And hell, I was making, uh, you know, six or eighty dollars a weekend, rough that. And then I did, worked a lot of overtime because they were always short-handed. And right after school, did you you kept uh, working in the well, industry? Right after school, actually, <coughs> Esso started up some new rigs, 
and I had been working with General Petroleums, and my dad came home one time and he said, well, Esso's going to start up a couple rigs. You want to go to work for Esso? So that's when I went to work for Esso. And, uh, but it, it was good with them because they're always camp jobs where, you know, you, you everything was found. Your wheels were found. Your, you didn't have to rent any rooms or anything. So it was good. And of course, back then we worked six weeks in and two weeks out. The hell of a way for a married life. But that's the way it was. And how, um, if we if we take actual examples, were there like in the forties and fifties, were there mandatory like hard hats, uh, gloves, or yeah, they that were kind of they, they had hard hats, but they were those, <laughs> those damn big heavy heavy hats. Oh, they were good hard hats. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, they were mandatory. And they have been for some time, but uh, again, it, the, the safety in some rigs maybe wasn't. They had so many green people and green drillers uh, and tool pushers that they just yeah, didn't have did, the experience. They didn't have the background. That the, the, the Imperial Law's own rigs, like Don's talking about, and I worked on, uh, they were good. They were safe. The drillers were safe. They looked after you. I never got hurt. I don't think. No. Did you, did you, did you well, know? I don't. I worked for GP for quite a bit too. Yeah. Well, I worked for Peter Bodden for a while too. I never yeah. had it. Yeah. Uh, if you were experienced, uh, the guys, the people who got hurt, were were the inexperienced, mostly. And did you see that often through your career? Yeah. A lot like of later on, when I was supervising rigs. That I saw because I had learned properly uh, the drillers I worked for were taught me. and my dad taught me and, and Don's dad taught me things on the rig because I worked with him so and uh, uh, so when I was out supervising rigs uh, uh, I knew most of the tricks and I knew uh, I would shut a rig down if they were working safe and, or I, in some cases, I went on the rig floor and showed the guy <clears throat> how to do it right. Uh, but I saw a lot of cases too where uh, I wanted to shut rigs down. Yeah. And, uh, and I had to go and show. Because of how unexperienced they were? Yeah, yeah. inexperienced. Uh, just for instance, uh, I was working out at Redwater, and the driller was a friend of mine who I roughnecked with in Saskatchewan. Uh, Harold Forbes. Remember Harold? Anyway, he was a driller, and, and this one roughneck was telling me, God, he says, my chest is hurting me. So I was watching him, and he wasn't keeping a stiff arm on the tongs. Oh. <laughs> and so when they were breaking out the joint, the tongs would come and hit him with the chest. Break his ribs. <laughs> I said to Harold, I, who was the driller, I said, why don't you go and show that guy how to do it right? You keep a stiff arm on, so I comes back like yeah. that. Just something natural, but the kid didn't know it. And uh, so Earl says, ah, he'll probably just quit anyway. I said, well, look, if you want me to shut this rig down, yeah, he can do that too. <laughs> well, okay, but I said, I'll go and show the kid. So I went and showed him. And the kid learned. After the trip was over, he come and thanked me. But I mean, that happens anywhere. I mean, in any job, whether yeah. you're working on the railroad or whether you're climbing telephone poles or whatever, safety is uh, safety is something that you have to instill in the workers as well as the management. And you got to be thinking about it all the time, so it's second nature. But uh, yeah, it's. Uh, a lot of people nowadays they they've gone to to uh, more hydraulic equipment. Everything's hydraulic, and so the, the roughnecks don't do as much. They've got joysticks and computers, and and everything's hydraulic, and they have to because the industry is still like that. They have so many rings and not enough trained people, and you keep getting people from. 
from uh, Nova Scotia, PEI, and Newfoundland, and all over the country, even the U.S., and, uh, and they go to work on a rig, uh, that they just had to do something. So now all these rigs are way, way more modern and less bulwark. So uh, it just had to be done. However, it's slower, and it costs you more. How is it slower? It's just slower. I mean, this equipment moves like this. You know? Yeah. Whereas it used to be. <laughs> it's automatic. You just, it was like a, a, a ballet, really. Yeah. And actually, what you should do is you come out to Leduc number one in August, and we run that rig out there. And we'll show you how you do it fast. Yeah, Cheryl was telling me. So, uh, but it is, they had to do it. Simple as that. There'd be too many injuries if they did. And uh, speaking of, uh, I guess, injuries or, or dangerous jobs, uh, can you guys tell me a little bit about uh, Atlantic Three and what happened there? Yeah. Because you, because you uh, guys were called in, right? Well, well, the printer law was. Uh, it was uh, Atlantic Three was drilled by a company, Atlantic Oil Company. That was owned by or run by uh, uh, I know who you mean. Uh, I can't think. Well, what's the what's the stadium in Calgary? McMahon. McMahon Stadium. It was by, by Frank McMahon. Yeah. And uh, he didn't really know that much about drilling, but he they drilled into one of the best wells in the field with the oldest, junkiest rig that he could find because. All the good rigs were running, and so when he went to hire a rig, was, he got what was left over. And uh, uh, they they didn't have the proper blow preventers on it, and and uh, they didn't have enough surface casing. So uh, and they drove into one of the best wells in the field. So they kept losing their mud, and, and yeah. finally it just got out of hand. And somebody shot it in and it cratered under the surface case because it wasn't deep enough. They didn't have enough surface case. Yeah. Well, didn't Red Adair come out to that? Yeah, they had, well, they had a guy by the name of Myron McKinley. McKinley, yeah. Uh, was the, the well killer, uh, wild well killer. And Red Adair worked for him at the time. Red Adair and Boots and Coots yeah. both mm -hmm. all worked for McKinley. McKinley. And Myron was probably the best in the world at that time. Yeah. But... At, at filling? At killing wild wells. Yeah. yeah. Okay. However, uh, that well couldn't be killed from the top. It had to be... Uh, it had to be what we call whipstock. It had to directionally drill from other wells. And so they always drill two. And that... In case one screws up. If I'm not mistaken, was that one of the first times that kind of technique was used? No. Or, no, no, it had been used around the world. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but it was, uh, directional drillers was, was pretty, pretty yeah. good art. It was like yeah. playing the violin. You had to be good at it. Yeah. And, uh, so in order to, in those days, now it's easy, but in those days they had to put wedges in the hole every once in a while to divert the bit. And uh, they had instruments that told you what direction you were going and, and what angle. And so, uh, it was quite a, but what happened was, uh, first of all, Atlantic never had enough money to kill it. Uh, it was producing 10,000 barrels a day on the ground. Now, they collected most of it and shipped it to uh, Nisker and Ledoux. Finally, they had a pipeline in. What was that bit, miss, they called it? It was the. Ah. It was a uh, solid stuff that uh, uh, waste, you know. That they put down? No. In the well? No. You mean Did you miss? Eh? Uh, Did you miss or something? And, uh, Did you miss? Uh, uh, that was. Like waste. He's talking about lost circulation material, sawdust and uh, 
Yeah, yeah. Matt, Samantha, and Sawdust, yeah. and yeah. all that. Ping pong yeah. balls. Yeah. Did they put feathers down too? Oh yeah, I put that. golf ball down. Golf balls. I heard there was like ten thousand pounds of chicken feathers or something. Yeah, they which tried was a lot. <laughs> that's before it cratered. They tried to plug it off, and and they would get circulation for a little while, and then they'd lose it again. And, and uh, they also they should have they should have uh, set casing above the zone before they went into. It. Yeah. However, they uh, they didn't, so it cratered. <coughs> And Imperial Oil took the well over. Well, the government took it over. The Conservation Board took it over, and then they hired Imperial Oil to to put it up. And uh, they brought uh, uh, Chuck Bear. No, they brought uh, uh, Charlie Visser and. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, what's his name? The, uh, no, uh, uh, <laughs> Tip Maroney. Tip Maroney. They brought uh, Tip yeah. in from. from <laughs> South America. He he was an imperial oil employee, but you brought him in, and uh, they they actually were in charge of, of uh, looking after them, and it was making so much oil that it was actually the imperial oil wells across the road were losing production because it was uh, dragging it, it was, down. Yeah, it was dragging down their production, so it was actually producing more oil than was really under their quarter section. So so anyway, imperial oil was brought in. Then they looked after Whipstock and the, the wells, Drexler, yeah. and they actually uh, got down with the first one and pumped water down, and that was enough to kill the well. And then the second one went down and actually hit the old hole, just by a fluke. And then they pumped cement down there and just filled it right up. So, uh, except for the surface. The, so, was the surface cleaned up properly? Pretty yet? well. It, there's still some bare spots there, but it's not the oil. The oil, the oil is biodegradable. It's the salt water that there's always a little bit of salt water that comes up with oil, and so there was so much oil, still ten thousand barrels a day spilled on the ground, that the little bit of salt water that is soaked into the ground has left some bare bare spots. But uh, and how long was it? Uh, how long did it take to actually? To put it out, I think right it blew for about six months, five or six months. And the last few days, it, it caught on fire, didn't it? Yeah, well, that's another story. Uh, that uh, fire, uh, I think it was the last five or six days of it. Uh, what happened was the uh, the oil gushing up into the into the uh, the rig sump, and and beside the rig, finally it washed away parts of the rig. And uh, or the the supports under the one leg of the rig, and one day it took the rig the derrick fell into the hole, and the next day uh, my mother and I, and Bertie Welch and his mother, were going into the Duke, and my mother stopped on the road right where the Duke Number One Museum is, watching the well because we hadn't seen it since the derrick fell in. Well, we're just watching it. Somebody said, oh, look, it's on fire. So we actually watched it catch fire. Good grief. Yeah, but it didn't explode. It was just a little fire in the middle of the song. Yeah. You just see it kind of... Kind of right, you know, yeah, yeah, I just went down. And then it started to run down the... Uh, the oil ran down the hill a little ways into some pits. And then it was pumped from there into the pipeline. So you can see the little flames running down the little rivers of water. And then I remember my dad and a bunch of them come tearing out of Devon and around the corner. And they got out with shovels. And they threw dirt on these little rivers of, oil, of flame. And uh, in the meantime, they'd order a calf. But they saved those pits from catching fire. Well, there's probably yeah. hundred thousand barrels of oil. Oil, oil in those pits. And how long did the fire last? Only about a week. About not a week. very long. Okay. Uh, then the first well, first Webstock well got down. Uh, they put it out. It was kind of lucky. That, uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Because they saved ninety percent of the oil. Of course, like any natural gas that comes up with the oil is uh, lost. So did did. Uh... Atlantic Three will more Imperial Oil actually end up making money out of that well? Or oh, yeah. I mean, uh, 
the, the stadium in Calgary isn't named after Frank McMahon because he's poor. <laughs> no, well, they, see, there was there was two other. That was like, there was two other wells on that quarter section that would, they let them produce, but they never let him produce any more oil out of that well. Of course, they couldn't anyway. What was his name again? Frank McMahon. Oh. Uh, well, who was Turda? He was the farmer. Uh, the owner of the number one. Oh, yeah, Mike Turda. So, uh, anyway, Frank, uh, uh, they couldn't produce oil out of that well again. And, but what, what, what the government, the reason the government had to take it over is because the, the farmer had the mineral rights. That was his name. Uh, anyway, that's another story. Uh, he, he had, so he had 12 and a half percent of any oil produced. Uh, Atlantic had their share, and then they had to calculate how much was down there. And then any that was produced more than was under that third section, they had to pay imperial oil for the oil that they stole across the road. <laughs> so it was a big, uh, it was a big job for the reservoir engineers at the yeah. conservation board yeah. to, uh, to figure all that. that. Yeah, to figure all that yeah. out and get everybody paid. But of course, McMahon made a lot of money from it too, as did the farm. Yeah. Now I was just wondering, uh, if, like. Because it must have wasted a lot of time and cost a lot of money to all that effort to try and and fill it. Oh yeah, well, and and all those people had uh, uh, invoiced the government for the money. Okay. The government actually handled the money, which was the only way to do it. Uh, and they hired Imperial Oil uh, to put it out. Yeah. I don't think they paid them all that much either, because yeah. Imperial Oil was happy to help out. Yeah. Yeah, that the old fellow in there. <laughs> that happened on the mineral rights. He uh, moved into the city. and uh, He was laughed at one day. Oh, yeah. But uh, a friend of mine uh, went to see him one time. Who oh, was that? Oh, what's his name? Funny Ferda. No. Anyway, uh, it was Huey Leeper went in to see him. Huey was telling this story. Went in to see him and he. Bank knocked on his door in town and uh, no answer. So he went around the back and he just got around the back. He could hear the old guy talking to his wife. And he said, If a, a wife, when I'm not buying a new washing machine, a washboard was good enough for my mother, it's good enough for you. <laughs> <laughs> but I think all of the wives. <laughs> That <laughs> one with Imperial Oil started with a full washboard. <laughs> I know I did. Yeah, for damn sure. But but uh, he had a million dollars though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if we uh, here, I'll start with uh, Mr. Hunt over here. Mr. Hunt, oh, and I'll ask everybody here. Uh, what's your fondest memory uh, that ties into work or your career? Oh, hell. If you had to pick one. <laughs> we have to get a pill, a memory well, okay. pill. I've, I've, I've done so damn many things. But yeah, or yeah, one one that you remember or I get the remember pills all the time. Uh, you know, again, I, I flew for 10 years and, 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 and around the drilling rigs and uh, so I had a lot of experience with the airplane and the weather and stuff like that. Uh, I don't know. So flying is definitely a... Yeah, flying was a big part of my life. That's that's neat. Not a lot of people get to say they. Pardon me. That's neat. Not a lot of people get to say they they flown for a living. Yeah, and, and in uh, in nineteen nineteen fifty, I think the drilling industry was really low. I think there maybe anyway. They were doing Arctic. They were doing geological work in the Arctic Islands, 
and they wanted to try the type of plane I was flying, so I ended up spending three and a half months flying in the Arctic Islands. And uh, uh, I don't say that was something that I, I, I really remember or appreciate, but anyway, uh, that was part of part of it is uh, uh, is the flying part of it that yeah. I was involved in, and uh, man is sleeping in the plane a couple of nights and forty below the weather, and, and so <laughs> so I had uh, some experiences like that. Looking back, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, but uh, well, Don, didn't you take a hockey team to? Japan or somewhere. In Asia. No, I, uh, <laughs> I actually went to Japan, and I don't remember why I went. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't. It wasn't I, the I, hockey I, team, though. I, I thought it was. It was. I thought team. you were starting hockey over there. Didn't you take horses over there or something? Yeah, I sold a lot of horses over there, and. Uh, Oh, quite fine. You sold horses because uh, was it from a, a farm you owned, or yeah, okay. And and they were they were cow horses. They worked cattle, and uh, I sold horses into Germany and Holland and Italy, Japan. Uh, some of them went to Australia. So you know, again, that was a big part of my life too, the horse business. Besides the oil business, but uh, the oil business is a that's what put me in that that area. So, <clears throat> but uh, well, what what about what what did they call it? Kobe meats or something from Japan? A certain way that they did it. Didn't you bring that over? <laughs> I I can't remember. I see, that he, he, I he's my hero, so I, I, but I, didn't, I haven't cut all these little articles out of the papers about you, Don. It's like, uh, <laughs> well, they were, and that's why I thought that you had started some hockey team over there. I was sure that I can't be that wrong. Well, I remember you went over, you told me a story about I don't know what that was for. Dreary. Oh, dreary. Oh, I, uh, <coughs> where the hell did we go? Oh, we went to the States, to Houston and uh, those oil guys. And then over to, uh, over to, oh, uh, hell. We're into, uh, I get to remember Bill. <laughs> no, I don't know. I uh, I have to think about what I do. I, That's you know, okay. I was involved in a lot of different things, and uh, a lot of them when I I want to forget. <laughs> a lot of them was around a little whiskey. <laughs> yeah, hell, that was a big part of the oil business too. Was the drinking. Yeah. Was, was for me anyway. Oh, you didn't drink. Oh, I did. Thank you. And and, and over here, what would be uh, your fondest memories tied to uh, <coughs> to uh, the oil industry or your career, really? Women. Women. <laughs> <laughs> Right, you I would think <laughs> I would think that his comradeship with the, with the guys that he worked with it's because he it's like he grew up in the depression years and he speaks fondly of those years because everybody helped each other there was no locked doors or you, you just automatically helped your neighbor so he speaks fondly of that time 
and it's the same with his time with Imperial Oil on the rigs. Uh, you know, the, all the guys pretty much got together, uh, socialized, and, as well as worked together, and so there was a lot of comradeship there. Well, what was the big um, go-to social activity for the guys? Uh, I think most of it was uh, that Ooh. you would invite, <laughs> yeah. no, but you invite theme here. people over to your home and <clears throat> you'd be invited back and yeah. stuff like that. And uh, of course, they used to call them shack towns, you know, when we would be moving our little houses every three months or so. <laughs> no, we so there. there was a lot of comradeship in, in that. Group. Because you weren't always welcomed with open arms to the community. I mean, they liked to see the think that the oil money was coming in, but before Sai came to my hometown, we had already heard that the boys were coming, and uh, you know, <laughs> the boys in the hometown were not happy about that. So, you know, they, they would say, oh, those roughnecks, well, that's what they call them, and, and uh, you can't trust them, they're, you know, hellions. <laughs> and what was your, uh, what was your fondest memory tied, tied into your, uh, your life alongside? Well, uh, so we were just newly wed, so it was like a big honeymoon, and he had built our shack, and I thought it was one of the nicest. And when my mother came to visit us in Shacktown, she said, yeah, I how, think long, all, uh, how long is this going to carry on? And, uh, I, you know, I figured that was going to be my life. I said, well, it's wonderful, Mom. You know, I really, I was proud of her shack. and. Uh, I saw nothing wrong with that type of life. That's, you know. Oh, but I don't know, I'm bringing all this stuff up. And one day, they, 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 we couldn't get any fuel because it was, it was so cold, eh? And it just at the end, and I just uh, got it o open, and then we had fuel again, eh? you know. Ah, oh, what a... Uh, it throws up on you. Eh? The fuel throws yeah. up on you. Yeah. yeah, and he was the kind of the electrician in the camp. And yeah. I guess that that was that red water or dap or something like that. And then uh, when we moved in the shack, like, you you know, we had no you couldn't try, try to tell us apart what was going on. And the, the, in the, 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 the carburetor, you see, it went up and down and it was going in and I had to finally take that because otherwise we would have burned up, you know, the oh, fuel they, was going. They let us move in the shack when they were moving us. Oh, <laughs> and we were going down Jasper Avenue. <laughs> and there was you were riding in the chimney? Yeah, and there was smoke <laughs> coming out of the chimney. <laughs> oh, oh, it's oh, unreal. Oh. It's unreal. <laughs> I never heard that one. <laughs> yep. Maybe we're the only ones that were stupid enough to, to do well, that. Well, I remember Ben Howery loading their shack with Elsie in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. With a what? With Elsie in it. Oh, it scared the heck out of her. <laughs> what would be one of your fondest memories associated with your career? Uh, uh, one of them. Well, I guess it would be one. Probably, you know, impressed me the most. Uh, my dad got a promotion out of it. We got to move into a house with running water. And uh, we had a skid shack, just like Don's dad had built a skid shack in the Duke movie. We'd build our skid shack in Provost, and I helped my dad build it. And, uh, we only had one move. For you, uh, 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 Provost, 
I was the first baby born in the world. Oh, I, was <laughs> I used to deliver bread to the hospital. Oh, yeah. And yeah. a wagon. I really like Provost. Yeah, I did too. <coughs> Was a, and I lived in that old abandoned hotel. Oh yeah. And you know, I I remember one night I was playing hockey, and after the hockey game, of course, it was nine or nine thirty, ten o'clock at night. I had my hockey bag on my shoulder, <laughs> and of course, I come out of the hockey rink, and we lived in an old abandoned hotel, that old abandoned hotel, and I'm walking down that side street, and there's a guy behind me. And I started to pick up a little speed, and he did too. Pretty soon I was running, and he was running too. <laughs> and of course, I run into the, we lived in that old abandoned hotel, and we were in the front, the front entryway. And I, <laughs> I run in, and it's, I was scared too. I thought the guy was after me. Oh, run in it? there, and I opened the door and kind of fell in the door, my hockey gear and everything. And, but actually, I think all he was, he's as, Probably scared when I started to run, he started to run too. That's how he did all this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You weren't, Cy wasn't one of the ones that stole the fire truck. Wasn't it? Tom Eastland? Well, I think. Uh, he might have been riding on it. You know what, in terms of fire? Oh, uh, in, in this little dish you Yeah. 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 Yeah, I remember. They stole the, some of the roughnecks stole the fire truck and the fireball. <laughs> well, oh, we, no. we, we got the water there uh, in the hall. Yeah. And uh, when it went, it went out and took off and uh, we had the fire truck and and <coughs> I I forget what the hell it but. Uh, Yeah, they, they left the, the fire hall open because that was the well in town. You went without your water. But uh, they were tearing around the town with the siren going, and, and then they got it stuck and they tore the transmission out. <laughs> so <laughs> then uh, the, well, uh, the Maori came well, to my dad's, yeah. woke my dad up, and gave us all the. Had to wear. <laughs> he said, so they they pick us up. They were going to throw him in the jail. My dad took, made sure. Well, I, if he was one of them, I thought he was, but I, I might be. I'm not sure. What? I don't, I don't know if you were one of them. Were you one of the ones that, that took the truck, fire truck? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I thought he was. <laughs> you know, I, I, worked, John, uh, I worked when I was funk. I, I worked at the uh, the dance hall. Jerry Horn and I, we trade off. He'd sell tickets, and I'd take them, and then we'd trade off, and I'd sell them. So that was a hell of a deal <laughs> at the dance hall. The guy would come in there plastered, and, and oh man, we had a hell of a time there. So uh, honest but, people. <laughs> but you know, that's the thing. You we'll borrow fire trucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But as far as uh, you know, I spent forty-five years in the business and uh, lived in it all my life. And, uh, there was a lot of good times. Yeah, good. You could years. A lot yeah. of good. I spent six years working in the Arctic. My family and I lived in Norman Wells for two and a half years. That was a that was a that was a good time. There was no cut uh, cut the uh, cut the uh, you know. Yeah. yeah. There was one on it. No cutthroat deals. No. Oh, all friends. <laughs> and if uh, we'll uh, we'll end it soon there. If I had to ask you, uh, gentlemen, to. Uh, if you were to speak to someone much, much younger, like children or students, uh, what would be your piece of advice regarding uh, regarding looking back at your career? What would you tell them as uh, as advice? Well, I tour a lot of kids out at Luke Number One, and I tell them uh, tell them first of all to get an education. 
And then look into the oil industry to see what uh, what they might be interested in, because uh, as you know from out at Living Number One, that there's so many different aspects to the oil industry that I'm sure there's one for you. No matter what your skill is, yeah. a nurse, a doctor, <coughs> a, a, you know, a geophysicist, a, a geologist, Pilots, pilots, all work. Uh, what was my clean down? Geologist. Eh? Geologist. Geologist. Yeah. Clint up? Yeah. My son's a, I got a son that's a geologist. Uh, so, I mean, mechanic. It's no end. There's no end of a opportunity in the oil industry. There's so many scientists. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was the mechanic. Then. Like electronics. Real big in how do they drill horizontally is easy. It's all electronics. So, but just like like I was saying, uh, it's it's kind of a big family. I mean, uh, I've talked to people from Texas, Louisiana, and and we all talk the same language. Yeah. And, and they'll tell you the same thing. Yeah. That that uh, uh, even though we're Canadian, big family. Americans, a big family, uh, yes. we got something in common, and uh, uh, and I'm sure it's a, the same in the Iron Forces. It's uh, in other other industries, miners. Uh, it's a, it's kind of a big family. So uh, that's what I would say. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Bramlett, any uh, any piece of advice or, or or things you would say to uh, to a much younger generation about their their career or looking at back at your career? Well, for one thing, we had no nothing period, you know, like. We all made it, and everybody was in the same boat, kind of. Yeah, we didn't know, we didn't have anything, and yeah. we didn't know about having anything. We yeah. didn't make the best of it. Well, war was just over. Yeah. You couldn't, you didn't even have gasoline to drive. No. You had gas coupons, meat coupons, and sugar coupons. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, so you, you made the best of what you, you had. Yeah, yeah. And, and before we had skid shacks, uh, we moved from town to town. Like I went to 17 different schools, so uh, we moved from town to town, and my mother and Harry Lyman would go ahead to the next town and find places for all the families. Didn't did they, uh, did they get come for the ring? But uh, 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 you don't you tell them know that. No, I don't want to know that. <laughs> Sad story. <laughs> but uh, so, and there was a war. Well, so, no, no. In southern Saskatchewan, was the lowest of low. Wasn't it? Yeah. We had tri weekly train service. If it didn't try this, if it didn't make it this week, it tried the next. <laughs> and and there was no fruit, there was no, came in twice a year. Uh, remember the pop truck came twice a year. <laughs> and that's all, that's all there was. Now if you were in Regina or Moose Jaw or no difference. Wilcox was okay, the, the train went through every day. Yeah. But, uh, but still you, you had to save your gas coupons in case you had to go to the doctor or the dentist. I mean, yeah, the times were tough. It was tough. Yeah. Yeah. And plus, everybody just came out of the Depression as well. And, and everybody had people overseas. So, I mean, to get to work, to get a job on a rig that paid good money, like a roughneck on a rig made more than a nightmare. But he worked on it, too. So, uh, I mean, he's always good pay. Nature calls. <laughs> you know, I really <laughs> never knew my dad. He was always away. The time of Ben Golf, we lived in the same house as your dad. 
Jack. Jack and the house caught fire. I just come out of school and I can see this black smoke and it looks like it's close to our place. So I come running home and looked up and there's your dad and Jack throwing all the furniture, which wasn't much, out of the window. They broke the window. And they're throwing everything they own, suitcases, <coughs> and then they started throwing out their dishes. And they live in the second story. So, and the, and you know what we all had for cupboards were just orange crates, you know, those double yeah. orange crates. And they're heaving these orange crates out with the dishes and stuff. <laughs> and half of them broke, but <laughs> they saved the other half. And we were all yelling at them. My mother was out there yelling at them, get out, get out, get out. And I, I can't remember how they got out. They must have went down the stairs. I don't remember them climbing out the window. Because I ran around the back and my mother was hauling all our stuff out. Of. She was dragging it all, a trunk and, and a big wooden box. Uh, she was dragging that all out, so I was helping her get our stuff out. And then Smith's lived in there. I think it was four of them. Good stuff. Yeah, they lived in there. Somebody else lived upstairs. Where was that at? Bendo. So. I remember when Smuffy Smith and his wife moved to Northport. They were in a little trailer, and I think they had what? Four, four, four or five, five kids. kids there. And I thought it was so romantic. <laughs> 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 Sometimes it's wonderful to be looking at life through those colored glasses like that, you know, that I think that's why I never complain. But, you know, I, I still think fondly of those times because, you know, to see... They were, the, they were good times. They were. were yeah. and, but to see the great-grandchildren now, and uh, they're, they're wonderful kids, but oh, they spend life. money like... Uh, there's no tomorrow. Yeah. And you really, you can't really say anything to them. Yeah. Because they, they don't understand. I mean, if they, they must have the money to spend it. But so what would, you, what would your piece of advice be? Uh, well, the one thing, Cy insisted that we never, whatever we bought, we had to pay for it in full, not to no finance, no credit, anything, yeah. not to have to pay interest and in anything. And so, you know, we save up for a certain piece of furniture or a fridge or whatever. And so, when we got that one thing, it was like Chris. It it was just wonderful. Hell I mean, you really yeah. celebrated that day that you got that. You appreciate it. Yeah. But now, you know, the kids, they get married and, and what well, they would consider living in a skinny jack, I don't know. But they want the house and all, like, all that they left home, they, yeah. they want that yeah. when they get married. Not building up to it, you know, just, yeah. I want it all now. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I don't know. They that. don't realize that they're, they they were never around when their parents built all of that. No. Right? Yeah. Well, of course, the finance companies are <coughs> in good shape. Yeah. Credit cards. They didn't, yeah. We didn't have credit cards. No. no. <laughs> to borrow on. So you need you needed but, to pay in full. You know, like uh, my my father, and I'm sure yours. Uh, he was poor five times in his life. You know, you're poor when you're born. <laughs> then came the First World War. You know, that was a tough slope. Then he got married. So he's broke, you know, broke again. <laughs> then Second World War. Then the, no, yeah. then the Depression. Depression. Oh, okay. Then the Depression comes along and he's yeah. out, of, out of work. Broke again. For a year and a half. For a year and a half. He was two years from the period of oil. Luckily, my mother got a job. Oh, for a while, and then I came along, but I don't think I broke it because my dad got a drilling job. Yeah, and then come along Second World War. 
So that's five times in a lifetime. Yeah. Hell of a and he always said he dreaded another depression. He had nothing else in his life did he fear more than, a depression. than having to be able to work again. And you know, and that I was stuck with. Mm -hmm. And I can always remember my mother saying, Oh, you can't have that, you can't have that. Even if they've got it, you can't have it, you haven't got the money. But there weren't too many people that had it. Like that no. was the one good thing, saving grace, really, that we were sort of all in the same boat. All the same. You can feel like any class distinction. Yeah. But, you know, I feel sorry for the really poor, like if they bought a TV, you know, you see what the really rich live like. Yeah. And, well, we had no idea. We saw everybody live like we did. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Most yeah. people did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I thought that skid shack was wonderful too. When we built it, it was so nice. God. Yeah. After yeah. living in chicken coops, and, and what happened was my mother, uh, well, Lynam's had a trailer, remember? Ken had a trailer. Yeah. But uh, my mother and Carrie would. Good houses for Smiths, and all the married guys. Yeah. Uh, make sure that they had a place to live. We moved to a hotel, and uh, and then we got what was left over. So uh, pretty tough to live. We lived in some awful places. Yeah, my so sister and brother-in-law, Green Jack Castillo, lived in a chicken coop. Yeah. In Marathon. Is yeah. that Marathon? Yeah. Was it? Yeah. And you, Mr. Hunt, if you had to uh, to give one piece of advice, looking back uh, on your career, what would it be? Well, <laughs> probably save your money. <laughs> first, first piece of advice, and uh, Do you remember years ago if you if a guy got was always quitting work and getting another job, we used to didn't think he was too reliable. And <laughs> it's kind of And now it's a now it's a more of a trend. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you're right. And now even it works like that with the government now. It's contracts. Oh right. yeah. It's not it's not permanent jobs anymore. So it works like that with uh, a lot of places now. Well, you know what? That's a that's a really good point because I I always thought because my dad worked for very well for forty four years that you, know, you should work for somebody. Stay yeah. with it. Mostly, yeah. However, I didn't, and I'm kind of glad I didn't. And my dad always said he would never do that again. What's that? Uh, well, stay with one company your whole, your whole career. Oh. Uh, and, the, and the reason I think he said it was because you, you wind up with some pretty rotten bosses. You'll have a good one, then you'll have, yeah, then. have a bad one. Then. And that's why I left the career for him, because I just, so pretty tough, pretty I just couldn't work for this guy. Ones. I can't say it was dangerous. It could have been, but uh, you know what my dad always <clears throat> had to. Yeah, he felt he had to. And, uh, and when, and Do for, what? Well, worked for him very long. Oh. Uh, he uh, he had some chances to go elsewhere. Uh, he never did. Uh, but I can remember him telling me the stories in Turner Valley that he was a roughneck. <clears throat> and he, a Canadian couldn't get a drilling manager. They would, the, head, the, the head drilling manager was a Californian, and he would bring in every alcoholic driller from California and give him a job. And so my dad and Lorne Leeson would work, work in the same crew, and they would work for these guys. And 
they knew more about the rig than, than anything that these guys, and then they get fired in another California. But, and he always told me this story about the one guy, they liked him because he only worked daylights. Because <laughs> when the tool push went home, he went down to the bootlegging joint, which was also a brothel. <laughs> <laughs> and he would spend the night there. And uh, uh, so when on afternoons, he'd come and sign the book. Tool push wasn't there. He'd go down to the, the bootlegging joint because Prohibition was on for a couple of years. And, uh, and so he'd leave my dad and Arnie to run the rig. Well, I think they worked for him for about a year. And uh, so they run the rig. And they liked him because <laughs> they got to run the no problem. They'd take turns. Great. <laughs> Larry worked one shift and my dad worked the other. They didn't like daylight so much because this guy was terrible. He was a terrible brother. Yeah. Couldn't never kill the barn. <laughs> what? what? You know, what's he that? couldn't never kill the barn. barn. This is an easy one. Yeah. Well, they were riding the blocks though. Oh, yeah. And, uh, he, the spiller never looked up the dairy. Yeah. So he just lifted up the brake handle and the box started yeah, coming yeah. out. But the box got hung up on the finger. So the box are just sitting there and the, all the lines the, are the, the lines coming down. He said, Lord, he said. <laughs> and finally my dad or somebody yelled at the guy and he slammed the brake handle down. And that kind of jarred the Blocks. blocks and they fell off the finger and Warren he dropped the boat. And I guess the blocks were swinging like that. Swinging like that. He sold them all. Oh, but it'd be a lot of screaming. <laughs> oh boy, are you screaming that all the time? And my dad said they had a prize fingers off the nails with, with a screwdriver. Morning. <laughs> yeah, it was a <laughs> I did a lot of work with Morning. He oh. got me sleeping one time. Hey. He got me sleeping on the dog was one time. But I admit I was sick. And I told Joe to get somebody else to work for him. He couldn't get anybody. So I said, I'll go. So when I went to work on graveyards, he, he said, well, dog, if you're not cooking, you can rest in the morning. So I was just, I, we had a card chair. Card table chair, and I was leaving time to rest the wall. I was sound asleep. I, I was really ill. Anyway, he came and kicked the chair out from under me. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you doing sleeping? I had a lot to do with Lorne. And he went and told Joe. Lorne Lisa. Yeah, I had a lot to do with Lorne. And then Joe and him had a fight because Joe told me to do it. Yeah. <laughs> but they didn't get along too well. Either. Joe Jackson. Uh, so, that was. That was most of your family, do they have, are they in the old business as well? Just my son, Jim. He's in the old business. Oh, the other two. They, they, they're there. Well, because well, Doris and Mark and Alan and, yeah, Garth, Mark, and Alan are all in the oil industry. Are those all your children? Well, that's part of that. No, three of. What the heck? There were 13. Where, where, where was I? And you interrupted I'm me. I'm sorry. And then my brain is gone. <laughs> <laughs> I know what is that in the dog house? Little dog? Uh, that's the cat house. I wanted to put a little red light in there. <laughs> oh. Right, we'll, we'll stop it here. Thanks a lot, everybody. Okay.